A Boiling Frog, The Modern Veiled Cultural Metamorphosis. We have been living through a cultural metamorphosis that has been so gradual it is easy to deny. Comparable, perhaps, to boiling a frog. Somehow a frog story seemed appropriate for us to use. It is said that it's impossible to boil a frog because its reflexes are so fast that it jumps off the surface of the boiling water. But the story continues with how to beat the frog. This presentation will discuss the metaphor of our cultural boiling process and the divine solutions that have accompanied the rising temperatures. We have been warned and informed in numerous ways. One most effective way has been through the value-catching means of stories embedded in the historical account as written in the Book of Mormon. The boiling of their culture is especially applicable. The broad-brushed storyline might be listed like this. Nephi's story of colonization of a new land. Jacob's struggle with apostasy and sin. Mosiah's transition from kings to a form of democracy. Alma then opens with the culture-changing priestcraft of Nehor, a religious front for a political power grab that will define all the conflicts in the remainder of the Book of Alma. The effects are sufficient to send Alma out to reestablish the church. During this period, an easily missed problem is briefly noted. The judiciary, the lower judges, begin to act independently from the executive officer, the chief judge. This will crescendo into the workings of embedded secret combinations much later in Helaman. As a result of missionary successes, the prophet Alma is imprisoned while his converts are stoned, burned, or evicted. The next chapters recount the great missionary work among the Lamanites. This is followed immediately by a sort of civil war over a dissenting Nephite initiated attempt to enslave the rest of the Nephite nation. In these war chapters, this civil war is followed quickly by the story of scheming despots, Amalekiah and Amaron, who escalate things into a series of war that consume their known world. The Book of Helaman opens with peace and the account of three brothers, who each in turn work to lead the Nephites. Pehoran, the eldest, is elected first. But Pehoran is assassinated, and then his assassin is killed by a servant. Pecumeni is then elected, but is soon murdered by an invading foreigner. Peankai never comes to political power. His fate is left untold. Now this story would be interesting in and of itself, but with the editorial of Moroni finishing his father's record, we discover that there is more to see, he states. Behold, I speak unto you as if you were present, and yet ye are not. But behold, Jesus Christ has shown you unto me, and I know your doing. Should we be reading this account knowing that it is a historical typology, that is, the author selected events and told his history in such a way as to parallel events in our day? So, we in this land of restoration also began with a colonization. The struggle over apostasy and sin led early settlers to yearn for independence. We too transitioned from a monarchy to a form of democracy. The struggle over religious contention was driven by priestcrafts. Joseph Smith searched for God's direction, resulting in the restoration of Christ's church. All during this period, beginning in 1803, with the Marbury v. Madison case, the Supreme Court began a process over the next 200 years that has morphed into what we now call the anti-constitutional process of legislation from the bench. Joseph Smith, too, was imprisoned while the early converts were persecuted, killed, and driven from Missouri. During this restoration period, the first missionary work was also to the Lamanites. Due to the ancient broken covenants, the murder of a prophet, the desecration of temples, and the acceptance of slavery, the nation plunged into a civil war. Joseph warned that it would eventually escalate into world wars which it did. President Benson said, The record of the Nephite history just prior to the Savior's visit reveals many parallels to our own day as we anticipate the Savior's second coming. Why does the book of Helaman signal such a cultural transition? No more mention of the Great and Abominable Church or the Order of Nehor. 
religious villains are replaced by political ones. Now, this story of three brothers looks familiar. Hmm. A presidential assassination where the assassin was then killed by a servant. A second brother then killed by a foreigner. And the third brother never comes to political power. Does this identify Helaman with the 1960s? If so, it is most concerning with the summary in the sixth chapter of Helaman. By this time in the story, in addition to the presidential assassination, the nation has experienced a father-son presidential succession, a war initiated by dissenters collaborating with the enemy, who then successfully attack the capital and gain control over many Nephite lands which then requires a prolonged war to resolve. This is followed by a secret combination influx into the government, whereby they work to change the national constitution, founded laws of King Mosiah. Then Mormon notes, And it came to pass, on the other hand, that the Nephites did build up the secret combinations and support them beginning at the more wicked part of them until they had overspread all the land of the Nephites and had seduced the more part of the righteous until they had come down to believe in their works and partake of their spoils and join with them in their secret murders and combinations. The more part of the righteous is alarming as they come to accept and support the ideology of the secret combinations, one of wealth and power at any expense. Well, no wonder Father warned Joseph Smith in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 38. Quote, And now I show unto you a mystery, a thing which is had in secret chambers, to bring to pass even your destruction in the process of time. And again I say unto you that the enemy in the secret chambers seeketh your lives. Now, wait. The remainder of the warning relies upon our understanding, the metaphor used. It is found in numerous other scriptures, but let's look, for example, in Mosiah 27. Remember, this is where an angel has visited the very successfully rebellious Alma Jr. Among other things, the editor records, The angel of the Lord spake, as it were, with a voice of thunder, which caused the earth to shake. And the angel said, I come to convince thee. End quote. Now, Alma Jr. had no desire to change his ways, but the angel was successful in convincing him in spite of his desires. So, a voice which causes the earth to shake, is one that convinces when we don't want to be convinced. Now, notice what that does to the rest of the verse in section 38. Quote, Lest the wickedness of men reveal these things unto you by their wickedness, in a manner which shall speak in your ears, with a voice louder than that which shall shake the earth. See the metaphor. Now, I would suggest that this convincing voice that changes our minds, willingness, and the culture is the media. Movies, television, video, music, and so forth. But not just for entertainment, also for education. Not just in group settings, but now in the personal privacy on our phones and computers. This is not a way out conspiracy theory, but one that acknowledges that now I quote from Paul, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Quote. Please take note, historically as noted by Robert Bork, a U.S. Supreme Court nominee in 1987, television's public morality originated in the moral relativism of the 60s, for the lawless youth culture that became manifest then is the modern liberal culture of today. Now, the 60s were not only the decade of assassination and media exploitation and drugs and free love and the hippies and campus demonstrations, but also one that saw these same liberal forces eliminating prayer and God from schools and the resultant plummet of SAT scores along with the escalation of divorce, crime, promiscuity, perhaps manipulated in part by the introduction of hormones into our food and water supplies. Now, we look askance at all that liberalism, but miss the voice shaking the earth. Elder Ballard warned 
images, fantasies, and models which we are repeatedly exposed to affect the self-image and later the behavior of nearly all young people and adults too. Children's minds are like banks. Whatever you put in, you get back 10 years later with interest. Many therapists have said, children who view TV violence tend to become violent. Now, Elder Maxwell noted, It's chilling, therefore, to learn that the days preceding the second coming of the Savior will produce conditions parallel in many ways to those in the time of Noah. It will take living prophets to keep us from sliding into the parallel insensitivity. There were undoubtedly many sinful conditions on the earth that brought the end of all human life. But what one does God mention for our learning in verse 30? And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. And behold, I will destroy all flesh off the earth. It was violence. It is fascinating that people are led carefully down to hell. Vice is a monster of so frightful mean, as to be hated needs but to be seen, yet seen too oft familiar with her face. We first endure, then pity, then embrace. But was the 60s effect only a symptom? Lower SET scores give us some connections to the causes. The Supreme Court justices that chose to remove all religion from the public square, including schools, and who then established secularism as the official sanction, were in their 70s and 80s at the time of the decision. They were born, therefore, in the 1880s and raised in the 1890s. Unknown to most of us today are some cultural changes that were initiated during these years. The prophet in 1894 noted, God has held the angels of destruction for many years, lest they should reap down the wheat with the tares. But I want to tell you now that those angels have left the portals of heaven. And from this very day judgment shall be poured out. Calamities and troubles are increasing in the earth, and there is a meaning to these things. Great changes are at our doors. The next twenty years will see mighty changes among the nations of the earth. It is by the power of the gospel that we shall escape pronounced to Wilfred Woodruff from the Tabernacle. In the article uh, quoting him, a footnote was added in retrospect. In almost 20 years to the day, the Archduke Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated, June 28, 1914, initiating the World War I. Now, a graph of worldwide calamities shows, firstly, that deaths due to three factors escalated notably epidemics, drought, and World War I. And just as the spike petered out following drought and World War II of the 40s and 50s, floods, earthquakes, storms, and etc. climbed dramatically from the 60s until today. Now, let's return back to our time marker of the SAT scores in 1962. The children there, the innocent victims, were 17-year-old seniors when they took the SAT tests. Who were they 17 years before, in 1945? Well, World War II had ended, and the soldiers were returning to marry and go to school and work. A cultural change was then accelerated. Now, note the movement from an agrarian rural society to an urban and then suburban lifestyle. By the end of the decade, over 50% of America would live and work in a city where the commute times and changes in the home would have deep implications in the mental models of these 60s students who are today's executives and CEOs. But for the adversary, stressing the family wasn't enough. Economic and political changes made a one-income family very difficult. The image of mother was denigrated until many women went off to gain respectability and add the additional financial freedoms they had come to enjoy. Again, Elder Maxwell astutely asked in retrospect, When the real history of mankind is fully disclosed, will it feature the echoes of gunfire or the shaping sound of lullabies?
the great armistices made by military men, or the peacemaking of women in homes and in neighborhoods? Will what happened in cradles and kitchens prove to be more controlling than what happened in Congresses? Statistics from a few key indicators compared pre-1960 life to today will yield revealing clues to our current dilemmas. Firstly, since adults serve as mentors to the next generation, let's look at the adult-child interaction time. For pre-1960s, it's average four and a half hours per day, that is 270 minutes of mentoring, conversation, instruction, correction, encouragement, and so forth. Today, the average has been dramatically reduced to 10 minutes, with eight of those minutes devoted specifically to four different types. Directed, expected, corrected, and then threatened, which equals that these kids are decked by their parents. Now, as with body growth, the brain progresses through gradual maturation with the development of new neural circuitry. The prefrontal cortex is the brain area where thinking, decision-making, and so forth occurs. It serves as the executive area that chooses between the appetite fulfillment of the midbrain, the survival drives of the lower brain, and the what-if logic of the upper brain. But the circuitry that allows for this what-if reasoning, enabling prediction, empowering good judgment and discernment, has undergone a change over the years. The neurological circuitry develop and responds to use, much like muscles. In the pre-1960s, these predictive neurological circuits developed around age 16. Today, that has been delayed until the mid-20s, in part due to the lack of adult mentoring and survival responsibilities connected with farm life. To thoroughly muddy the waters for our youth, values, those shared principles that bind us together in spite of our differentness, were homogeneous in the pre-60s. We could identify the good old American values obtained in part from a shared biblical origin and the Bill of Rights for most citizens. This allowed for a value-centered interdependence that empowered the American unity and world leadership. Today, in the name of tolerance, schools, our federal laboratories of social engineering, are required to teach up to eight different value systems. And TV and other screen time is so full of experimentation with many conflicting value systems that having one becomes confusing. Today, the average screen time for kids is 40% of their consciousness. Without a value system, they are left knowing that there are multiple options but they don't have enough experience or brain development to choose from them. They then devolve into experimentation, or worse, a tolerance-centered counterdependence, where what they choose in the interest of striving for independence is its counterfeit. Whatever you want me to do, I will do the opposite. Now, let's juxtapose the pre-60s family life in summary. It might look like this. In the pre-60s, there was a good basic training for adulthood. It was mentoring. They were working alongside each other. Today, there's little basic training for adulthood. In fact, parents are often more concerned with keeping kids entertained so they can get their own things done. Pre-60s, there was much family sharing. They were at work together. They did activities and spent much time together. Today, little family sharing. Then, there was extensive basic life training. It was very habilitating. Today, a little basic life training. It's non habilitating Back then, there were consistent role models. Today, we have conflicting role models. The means of discipline were natural consequences. Nature did most of that. Today, we do a lot to avoid nature and the natural consequences. B.F. Skinner had us replace logical consequences with reward and punishment. That puts the parent is the intermediary and the deliverer of the punishment and makes them the bad guy. Then there were intergenerational associations. Today, there's little generational, intergenerational association. Then there were no other peer groups but the family. Today, there's a dominating emphasis on the peer groups and friends. 
But then there were a few hours of education, and any information they had was applied information, how to do something. Today, there's many hours of education, and most of the information is surplus, in fact, overload. It was a low-technology time, but there was much time to ponder. Today, it's a high-technology time, but we're filled with a constant barrage of sound. The still small voice hardly has a chance. Then, of course, families were large. The peer group were siblings. Today, they're small families, and they rely on this external peer group. There were few broken homes at the time, only 10%. Today, over half, 55% of our youth live in broken homes. In fact, 40% were born to singles. Then it was a work-centered home. Time together was a mentoring time, a training time. Today, work is separate from the home. And then there was little anonymity, no time to think of self. Today, there's constant anonymity. Self is the constant thought. And even that is filled with noise. The breakup of the family is having major effects on our children. If the 1960 kids are at the root of today's problems, then these millennial kids with no intact families, value systems, delayed judgment development, and growing addictions will lead to the chaos prophesied for the winding up scenes that seem so frightening and beyond imagination. Without diligent intervention, 55% of our rising generation will exhibit a reduced learning capacity, difficult interpersonal relationships, emotional need of help, emotional scarring, reduced health, loneliness, unhappiness, more anxiousness and insecurity, a greater propensity to choose criminal solutions to life's challenges, fewer friends, more aggressive behavior, doubled suicide tendency, and less education. You now the doom and gloom of this paradigm could leave us hopeless. But then a study of the natural man and the strategies and goals of the adversary show mortality as an impossible and dangerous maze. Without God's help, there is no way to successfully navigate the dangerous waters and poisonous creatures that otherwise consume us. What has Father's Atonement Delivery System been doing through the years of this escalating, deepening crisis? In addition to the scriptural models and commandments, as well as the aforementioned prophetic warnings of 1894, before urbanization reached 50%, the first presidency, led by Joseph F. Smith, encouraged the church membership on April 27, 1915, to hold a weekly family home evening, set apart for prayer, hymns, family topics, and instruction in the gospel principles. Then as urbanization rose to almost 70%, this in 1964, David O. McKay re-emphasized the family home evening and published a family home evening manual during the next year. Five years later, in 1970, Joseph Fielding Smith designated Monday evening as family home evening night throughout the church. A decade later, the First Presidency issued Proclamation No. 4, detailing church progress, defining core doctrines, declaring its mission and message to the world including details for the family, and then announced a block schedule to give more family time to the Sabbath. Five years later, they released a new Family Home Evening resource book and video supplements so parents could instruct in interesting and fun ways without the heavy time expenditure needed in preparation. Then as urbanization approached 80%, in 1995, the Family Proclamation to the World was announced and disseminated throughout both the church and, and world governments. How well have we incorporated this revelatory document into our family value sharing time? Are we conversant with the 23 principles contained therein? Marriage is ordained of God. Marriage is central to God's eternal plan of happiness for man. Male and female were created in the image of their divine parents. All men and women have a divine nature and destiny. Gender is an essential characteristic of our eternal identity and purpose. All men and women, as spirit children of God, accepted His plan of happiness. The plan of happiness required a physical body and earthly experience in order to achieve its purpose of divine destiny. 
the plan, if followed, including covenants and ordinances of the temple, enables eternal family relationships with each other and our heavenly parents. Multiply and replenish the earth was both the first essential commandment to man and it remains in force today. The power of procreation is thereby sacred only to be employed in a lawful marriage between husband and wife. Both life and the means by which it is conceived is divinely appointed and essential to the plan of happiness. Husbands and wives have a solemn responsibility to love and care for each other and their children in righteousness. Parents are responsible to God to love and provide for the physical and spiritual needs of their children, including teaching them to love and serve each other, observe the commandments and laws of their country. Happiness comes in family life and results from a foundation of Christ's teachings, including faith, prayer, repentance, forgiveness, respect, love, compassion, work, and wholesome recreation. Fathers are divinely charged to preside in love and righteousness over their families. Fathers are responsible to provide the necessities of life and protection for their families. Mothers are divinely charged with nurturing the children. Fathers and mothers are divinely charged to help each other as equal partners. Death, disability, or other circumstances may necessitate extended family support. Divine warning against immorality, spouse, or child abuse of any kind. Those failing to fulfill the above responsibilities will stand accountable before God. Family disintegration will bring prophesied calamities on individuals, communities, and nations. All are called to promote these ideals in maintaining and strengthening the family as society's fundamental unit. In 2009, President Julie Beck brilliantly instructed CES instructors throughout the church. She said, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we have a theology of the family that is based on the creation, the fall, and the atonement. The creation of the earth provided a place where families could live. God created a man and a woman who were the two essential halves of a family. It was part of the Heavenly Father's plan that Adam and Eve be sealed and form an eternal family. The fall provided a way for the family to grow. Adam and Eve were family leaders who chose to have a mortal experience. The fall made it possible for them to have sons and daughters. The atonement allows for the family to be sealed together eternally. It allows for families to have eternal growth and perfection. The plan of happiness was a plan created for families. The rising generation need to understand that the main pillars of our theology are centered in the family. The proclamation on the family was written to talk about the family being central to the Creator's plan. Without the family, there is no plan. We know from our studies up here at church headquarters uh, with the rising generation that our youth are increasingly less confident in the institution of families. They're less confident in their ability to form a successful eternal family. And because they're less confident in families, then they're placing more and more value on education and less and less importance on forming an eternal family. We know from visiting with them and conducting studies that they show a lack of faith in their ability to be successful. They don't see forming families as a faith-based work. For them, it's a selection process, much like shopping. They don't see it as something that the Lord will bless them and help them in. They also distrust their own moral strength and the moral strength of their peers because temptations are so fierce they aren't sure they can be successful in, in keeping covenants. There are uh, media messages everywhere that are anti-family and our young people are very connected with media. Internet, TV, the things they get on their phones, all electronic devices are delivering anti-family messages to them every day. They're being desensitized about the need to form eternal families. Satan knows this. 
He will never have a body. He will never have a family. And he will target those young women who create the bodies to come and who should teach the families. And they don't even know what they're being taught and the messages. It's just seeping in almost through their pores. The family is the Lord's basic delivery system, whereby he does his work to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. The work of the atonement is not finished, but according to the proclamation, the divine plan of happiness enables family relationships to be perpetuated beyond the grave. Sacred ordinances and covenants available in the holy temples make it possible for individuals to return to the presence of God and for families to be united eternally in an immortal at one month. We can only act now in the present, with only high adventure left in the future mortal winding up scenes. We need not act using the tools God has provided to strengthen our families that would otherwise be torn asunder. The numbers don't lie. The precipice is inevitable. But by taking quiet action within the walls of our own homes, and public action in the voting booth, we may rely on higher powers and pressing forward by relying on the merits of him who created us and gave us this probationary state to become all that we will allow him to make of us as we cross over the gulf of misery and endless woe during the modern mighty storms and fierce whirlwinds beating upon us. We cannot fail.